Preaching of God's Word this morning is from the ninth chapter of Job. If you'd open in your Bibles, Job chapter 9, verses 22 to 24. In the Pew Bible, you'll find this on page 536. Let us pray together to the Lord for his blessing. Oh Lord, we come to your word this morning, believing with all of our heart that it is powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword, able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the very heart of man. We know it is by your word that you brought the world into being out of nothing. It is by your word that you revealed your wonderful self. It is by your word that faith is born and cultivated and strengthened and matured. It is by your word, O Lord, that the world endures until heaven comes. So we know your word is powerful and able to do amazing and a wonderful thing in our hearts today. But Father, we know it is by your spirit alone that that can be done. And so we beg of you and we plead with you this morning that this word will be taken up as a sword in the hand of your own spirit who can minister to the hearts of all. Bring home to us what we need. Speak to us the word that we desperately need to hear. Tell us, O oh Lord, what we need to hear, even if we do not want to hear it. And bless us with your truth, that by it we may live. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning in verse 22, this is the word of God. It is all one. Therefore, I say, he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When disaster brings sudden death, he mocks at the calamity of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the face, faces of its judges. If it is not he, who then is it? Thus saith the Lord. Oh, beloved, we know all the saying, we all know the saying that sometimes we can look so closely at the trees that we lose sight of the whole forest. Sometimes we can fo focus so completely on a single note that we forget the entire rhythm. Well, for all the truths that we have learned together in this book, and for all the good that it has done our souls and our daily walk, if you feel like you've lost your bearings at any point in this book, then the passage before us this morning is for you. If you read the book of Job and you get lost in the debate, then this is a passage to circle. Because in these three verses, Job speaks to the heart of the disagreement between him and his friends. What he says here is at the heart of every response he makes to them and reveals what's at the heart of every accusation they make to him. This is where their presuppositions not only divide, but really clash. This is where they add loggerheads. So let me lay it out for you briefly, and then we'll get into the text itself. Basically, as you know by now, Job's friends believed that those who were righteous in this life inexorably enjoyed a good life. Which means, of course, that no one suffered a life of misery and hardship but the wicked, obviously, because they're wicked. So that even if the righteous were troubled, and that did happen sometimes, it'd only be for a short while, and then they'd be suddenly lifted up again. A vindication would come quickly, in other words. Because God never suffers a righteous man to be overwhelmed or buried with afflictions. Which is why Bildad said in chapter 8, verse 20, to which Job is really replying here, he says there, God won't reject or cast off a blameless man. That's not what God does, says Bildad. But Job knew better. And Job's own experience was a screaming testimony to what he knew to be true. That a godly man may not only be afflicted by God, in this life, but so afflicted as to be destroyed and utterly stripped of all worldly comforts. In fact, a godly man may even die a godly man under those afflictions. Just look at Lazarus as the, at the rich man's gate. And what was the reasoning given on the other side? Well, he had his bad things in life. Now he gets his good things. You, on the other hand, had your good things. Now you get your bad things. His whole life was bad things. He died under bad things. He died in the midst of dogs licking his sores at the rich man's gate. 
not even a crumb upon which to feed. And yet, a godly man. Which again brings us to the heart of the issue here. When Job's friends saw him not only afflicted, but completely destroyed, and not simply cast down, but left by God in that state, then they had no other option but to number him among the wicked. And so Job really hits the nail on the head in this passage, and he argues in response, as he puts it in verse 22, God destroys both the blameless and the wicked. Which leads to one of the greatest lessons taught in this book. One of the greatest lessons taught in this entire book. That a man's spiritual standing before God cannot be infallibly determined by the way God treats him in this life. I'll come back to that point in the applications. But it reminds me now of a book, a commentary, not really a commentary, a series of essays written on the book of Job by a gentleman several years ago, and the title is, Is This How God Treats His Friends? The structure of the passage before us this morning in these three verses is pretty straightforward. In verse 22, Job makes his argument. And then in verses 23 and 24, he illustrates it, and then he concludes it. So let's come to this and see what the Lord has to teach us. We learn by now that Job can agree with his friends about the power, the greatness, the justice, and the wisdom of God. I mentioned in my opening sermon on this book some time ago now that this is one of the greatest treatises of divinity or deity, the theology, the doctrine of God in all the Bible. So well and so great and highly does does it speak of God's power, greatness, sovereignty, his wisdom, his justice. It's amazing. But on this point, Job cannot agree. Job will yield to his friends in in nearly every point of theology but this one. This is where they part ways. This is the litmus test for which side they're on. The relationship between God's favor and God's providential dealings. As if his providence, again, were were an infallible determination as to where his favor lies. And so Job says here in verse 22, it's all one. Which is to say, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I've said it and I'm not going to unsay it. He's putting his foot down. He's frustrated. Eliphaz was a little harsh. Bildad harsher still. Zophar the worst of them all. Who will give the next speech? What Job says here is sort of like what Pilate said in John 19 verse 22 when he was asked to alter the inscription, you remember, above our Savior's head on the cross. He was told to change it. Don't say, I am the king, of the, the king of the Jews. Say, he said he's the king of the Jews. And what did Pilate respond? What I have written, I have written. That's what Job is saying here. Job said, I put it out there, and you can eat my words, because I'm not budging, ever. So for Job, this is the great hinge upon which the whole dispute with his friends turns. This is the great axiom or the foundation upon which Job builds all his arguments in the whole book. This is that royal fort in which Job takes refuge against all their accusations. He comes back here every time. This is that one truth with which he foils and scatters all their arguments. He keeps coming back with a but, as it were. But this, but this, but this. This is the master move by which he pulls the carpet out from underneath them entirely. So that as Elihu reasons, as he begins his speech in chapter 33, you guys have said nothing of any worth. You've never answered Job. In all your speeches, you've never answered him. Because they could not answer this reply. And then he says it. it, What is it that is the foundation here? It's this. God destroys both the blameless and the wicked. In other words, Job is saying here that God is no respecter of persons when it comes to temporal afflictions. God sends them out on both the just and the unjust alike. Now, of course, maybe your mind is thinking already of the many instances in Scripture. There have been times, notable times, when God has made a remarkable distinction. In the flood, God distinguished Noah and his family from a whole world living in the bond of wickedness. In Egypt... God distinguished his people from the Egyptians by, for example, sending plagues on all of Egypt while shielding the land of Goshen in which the Israelites lived. So that where there was darkness, yet in Goshen there was light. God made a distinction. 
And in Sodom, of course, God led Lot and his family out before destroying that wicked city with fire from heaven. But exceptions aside, in general, temporal afflictions are no respecter of persons. Swords see no faces. And of course, Job is not saying that there's no difference in God's eyes between the righteous and the wicked. That's not what he's saying. In fact, there's the greatest difference imaginable between the righteous and the wicked when it comes to their standing before God. We know this. The righteous are reconciled to God through Christ and are therefore under his fatherly care, period. Whereas the wicked are at enmity with God because of their sins and are under his just wrath, period. Which is why Abraham said, ahead of the destruction of Sodom, in Genesis 18.25, Abraham says in his intercession for Sodom, for Lot and his family in particular, he said to the Lord, far be it from the judge of all the earth to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked, so that the righteous are treated the same way. Far be that from the judge of all the earth. And we believe that. We confess that. That's true. That's good theology. So Job's not saying there's no difference in the eyes of God or in the standing before God of the righteous and the wicked. Rather, Job's point is this, that God's temporal judgments are common to all men, regardless of their standing before him. Whether those judgments be persecutions, whether those judgments be tsunamis, whether those judgments be a virus, whether those judgments be broken homes and prodigal children and heartbroken lives. Troubles and trials are the common, inescapable lot of all men in this fallen world. In chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, Job put it this way. Man. Notice he doesn't say the righteous. He doesn't say the wicked. He says man, because it's true of all of us. Man who is born of woman, that's all of us, is few of days and full of trouble. He comes out like a flower, however beautiful and wonderfully made, and yet withers. And in defense, you remember, of the death of Uriah, a man more righteous than David in the account, David's justification to Joab for Uriah's murder was simply, well, the the sword devours now one and now another. What's the difference? Which again is why one's temporal condition cannot serve as a litmus test for one's spiritual condition. Now obviously Job knew his friends weren't any more inclined to budge than he was on this matter. So Job proceeds now in the next two verses to offer two illustrations. One to show that the righteous are afflicted and the second to show that the wicked are exalted. The first is in verse 23. This is a more difficult one. He says, When disaster brings sudden death, God mocks at the calamity of the innocent. What Job is saying is this. Bildad, The righteous are so far from being spared temporal afflictions that God stands by and laughs at their calamity. That's what he's saying. Now those words, as well as the words in verse 22, that God destroys the blameless and the wicked alike, as well as the words in verse 24, that God has given the earth to to the wicked, covers the face of the judges. This passage as a whole have such a sharp edge to them that it's caused many a soul to be wounded. Like the followers of Jesus in John 6, verse 60, who went away saying, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Many have come to a passage like this and says, is that what God is like? I can't can't be a part of that. But is Job really saying that God takes pleasure in his people's sufferings? How can that be right? How can that be right? Isaiah 63, 9 says of the Lord our God, in all their affliction, speaking there of Israel and therefore of the church in its entirety, in all their affliction, he, our God, was afflicted. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. God was afflicted in all their afflictions. And this we apply directly to the Lord Jesus Christ who is afflicted in all our afflictions. And what a more clear testimony do we need than when Saul of Tarsus persecuted the church and the Lord appeared from heaven and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
as if Christ felt the knocking at his ankles, though he was seated in the heavens, because his church was being bruised and struck down by Saul. You're persecuting me. I feel that as much as to say, my heart breaks for that. The, the entire Old Testament narrative is filled with testimonies to the Lord's breaking heart in the face of his people's hardships. Two verses from Hosea chapter 11 should settle the issue for good, and we don't need to say more. Hosea 11, verses 8 and 9. Hear these words. This is what the Lord says in the face of his people's waywardness and the hardships they suffered at his own hands because of it. Listen to the Lord. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim, which were cities surround, around Sodom and Gomorrah? My heart recoils within me, says the Lord. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst. I will not come in wrath. God's heart breaks over his people's pain. Like a father when he has to discipline his son, God's heart recoils within him to ever take up the rod and lay it across our backs with more, any more force than a feather. His heart grows warm and tender at the sight of our suffering. His heart boils over with compassion when he hears our cries. He sees our brokenness. So that there's nothing less true than the idea that God stands by and laughs at our calamity because his hardened heart finds joy in seeing us suffer. How in the world, beloved... How in the world can the God whose own heart bled out on the cross to deliver us from suffering ever laugh at our suffering? How in the world can the God who was wounded that we might be healed ever stand idly by and laugh at our wounds? It's impossible. It cannot be. So what does Job mean then? Well, it helps to remember, as we learned last time, that Job's in a real struggle of faith in this chapter, as you would be. It helps to remember that he's having a very hard time finding a foothold for his faith in the truth of God's goodness to him because his experience of God's care for him has so suddenly and radically changed where there once stood a million comforts, God has raised up nothing but sorrows. And what Job once knew as pleasures, friends, the wife of his heart, and countless of other things have all been turned into pains. So Job was convinced of God's greatness. He was convinced of God's power. He was absolutely convinced of God's sovereignty. And he even knows that God is not punishing him for any sin. And so he continues to hold on to his integrity and his innocence. But from where Job is sitting, covered in sores, on an ash heap, having lost everything, God's goodness is pretty hard to see. So when Bildad says in chapter 8, verse 20, that God wouldn't ever cast off a righteous man and leave him to suffer un under an affliction, Job replies with these words, If it pleases him, God will most certainly cast off a righteous man and will most certainly leave him to suffer under the weight of an affliction. Mark my word, Bildad, if it pleases God, he will stand by at the calamity of the innocent and do nothing to deliver them. That's what Job says. Because laughing, the laughing of which Job speaks here, is not the hard-hearted laughter of a cruel despot who gets his jollies out of watching someone suffer. Rather, it's this. The apparent passivity. The apparent passivity of a God whom Job knows to be all good and only do good. 
the apparent passivity of a God whom Job knows to be perfectly righteous and doesn't regard the righteous as the wicked. The apparent passivity of a God whom Job knows to have covenanted with him to be his God and to do him good as the fruit of that covenant commitment. You see, Job knows that God has the power to intervene. But it looks like God is standing by with his arms crossed in disinterest, a sideliner. Job knows that God hears his cries, which is why he keeps talking. But it looks like God's ignoring those cries. Job knows God could so easily remove these afflictions. But it looks like God's enjoying it because he just keeps piling them on. So do you understand what is going on here? We are not to take verse 23 as teaching that God enjoys watching us suffer because the rest of scripture will not allow that. Instead, we're to read verse 23 as indicative of the real struggle of faith that we all go through when we're faced with the apparent passivity of our Heavenly Father to our cries for help. When the heaven seems to have turned to brass and our prayers seem empty. They never return with any blessing. Job is not accusing God of enjoying his pain. He's simply saying to Bildad, that the righteous are so far from being spared the temporal trials of life that when God has a reason to do it, he will crush the righteous with trials like spices in a mortar. And so Job is struggling, as many of, we have, of us have. Not because he thinks God enjoys watching, but because he's at a loss. He's at a loss how to reconcile God's painful providences with his faith in God's goodness and justice. How does this work? How can God be only good and do all good? How can God love me and treat me like this? How can I be a friend of God and be treated like an enemy of God? This is the struggle. Job is not accusing God of being anything other than what he knows God to be, sovereign in power, in control, having a reason for what he does, a spotless reason. But oh, how hard to see when we don't understand it. Because God's hand seems so against him, Job's having a hard time finding any comfort in believing that God's heart is for him. That's what's going on. Job's second illustration in verse 24 is very straightforward. He simply says, The earth is given into the hand of the wicked, and God covers the faces of his judges. Job says, Look around. The wicked are so far from being made, the grounds and the, are the marks of temporal afflictions that God gives them the earth. Let's face it, to whom did God give all of Job's riches? But the Sabians and the Chaldeans. Who got all of Job's goods? Who got every good thing that had been given to him temporally? The wicked. How did this really get home? God gives them the earth. Job is basically pointing out that God advances wicked men. God raises them up. And most times gives them far more than their handful of this earth. Remember Psalm 73 and Asaph's struggles? My feet had almost slipped, he said, because I looked around at the wicked and saw how prosperous they are. And I looked at my condition and saw how troubled I am. This doesn't make sense to me, he says. Just look at how wicked Jeroboam was given ten tribes. And Rehoboam only two. Benjamin's even barely mentioned. Or how wicked Jehu was given a promise for four generations of sons to sit on the throne. He was wicked. Why would he get a descendant? Why would he even have even one son on the throne? Yet he had four generations. Or how wicked Nebuchadnezzar was given the whole earth for his kingdom. So how can Bildad hold that the wicked inevitably and always suffer a life of hardship and misery in this life? That's just simply not true. And how can his friends 
hold that there's an unmistakable connection between one's spiritual condition and one's temporal treatment. Because for reasons only God knows, says Job, God can be seen to stand by at his people's sufferings as if he enjoyed watching them suffer. And God can be seen to put the good things of this life into the hands of the wicked as if he appeared to approve of their behavior. Whose side is God on? In verse 24, Job closes his case with the challenging question which he knows his friends could not rebut. If it's not he, then who is it? They all believed in God, the one true and living God. There's no idolatry here at all. They're monotheists worshiping the one true God and creator. So Job simply says, if it's not he, then who is it? If nothing in this life is the product of chance or fate, but all in life is the will of God himself, then he's the one who orders his people's trials as well as distributes to the wicked their portions. No one else has the sovereignty to order and dispose the things of this world as he pleases but God. And therefore to God alone belongs the glory as well as the mystery of his governance of all things temporal. So that he raises up one and brings down another. Gives one a tremendous lot and leaves another with nothing to die poor and broke. So what do we take from this passage? What do we glean from these hard sayings? There are a lot of things that came to my mind in preparation for this message. And I let a lot of things go. And I chose instead to stick just to the main point. As sharp as it is, Job's main argument is that his friends were wrong to say that he was wicked just because God's hand was heavy upon him. Because when it comes to temporals, in his sovereignty, God treats all men alike, painfully afflicting both the blameless and the wicked. So I want to add four sugars, as it were, to that bitter truth to help us embrace this truth with submissive faith. First off, let me remind you that while both the people of God and the enemies of God may fall under the same afflictions. Beloved, they're not really being treated the same by God ever. Simply because the fundamental fact remains that God's heart is not the same towards them. We say of someone when they do a certain thing, whether it was done or bad is really determined by what? What was your motive? You hurt me, but did you mean to do it? If they meant to do us, then that was terribly evil. But if it was not meant and not intended, if they meant well, but it didn't go so well, then what do we do? We love, we forgive, we understand, we let it go as it were. The righteous and the wicked are not the same in God's heart. And that's really what determines what's going on and how we ought to see what happens. You see, because towards his enemies, the Lord acts in wrath and anger, using all their trials, even their prosperities, which is a tremendous trial. Just look at God's people and how many have fallen from prosperity because of prosperity and been taken up by riches and lost their way. God uses their trials to expose their sins and vindicate his judgment so that we look on and say, it is right that God destroyed them because their sins are exposed. But towards his own people, the Lord God acts in mercy and grace using their trials to purge their sins and to further his work in them. But the thing to understand here is not that those two things happen. We know those things happen. But the thing to understand here is that our all-wise God accomplishes both these ends by the same means. That's what's remarkable. That's what's truly wonderful and awesome. God uses the same heat to harden the clay hearts of the wicked and melt the pliable hearts of his people. God uses the same furnace to consume the wicked like chaff and to refine his people like the precious and priceless gold. So that while God's hand may move temporally against all men in the same way, 
bringing to them all the same riot, the same virus, the same explosion, the same hardship, the same torn marriage, the same broken home. His meaning and his motive behind it is not at all the same. Because his heart's not the same in both cases. Against the one, he moves in judgment as a foretaste of what's to come. To the other, he moves in love. To the one, he acts in justice. To the other, in grace. To the one, he deals out their due. To the other, he gives his gifts. It's not the same. It's never really the same, despite the face of it, that it looks the same. Because the real determination of whether it is the same or not is determined by God's motive and intention in it. What is he doing? What's he building in there? What is God up to? We throw chaff in the furnace and we know exactly what the intention is, to burn it, to consume it, so nothing is left and nothing but the germ is preserved. But if we throw gold in the furnace or silver in the furnace, we're not troubled. We're not all of a sudden taken aback because what a terrible refiner this person is. We stand back and look at his wisdom that he knows exactly how to measure the heat, know exactly how to determine the fire. To remove the dross and to actually save the gold, to distinguish the gold, to separate the gold, to draw out the silver. What a wise refiner. What a good refiner. What an amazing refiner. We stand in awe of his skill and craft. And so it is here. Even though we may all fall under the same afflictions, we're not really being treated the same, beloved. In that, Job's words really need a qualifier. And therefore, secondly, let me remind you that the trials of the saints are the trying of the saints. They're occasions to exercise our graces. They're opportunities to give proof, as it were, what sort of people we are. Just what metal are we made of? Are we what we say we are? Has it not been throughout history by the persecutions of the church that the hypocrites are driven out? Has it not been but by factions, as Paul said to the church in Corinth, that the real Christians, as it were, stand up? And those merely hanging on for buy-ins, for other reasons, suddenly abandon the faith and embrace their heart's desires all the while, even as Demas, in our earlier passage, loved this present world and went after it? How can you travel with the Apostle Paul and see and hear all that happened in the Apostle Paul's ministry? And just walk away. Now, something else was going on entirely, wasn't it? We saw what metal Demas was made of. So we saw what metal Paul was made of when he rejoiced in his sufferings and preferred calamities and hardships because now I see God's grace is sufficient for me and his strength is perfected in my weakness. It's an entirely different response. So it changes things when we realize that the trials of the saints are the trying of the saints. So that if God ever appears to stand idly by and do nothing, or if God ever appears to ignore our cries, not answer our prayers, or if God appears to just put more weight on instead of taking just a little bit off, let's understand that God is trying us because he wants to see us wage the good warfare. When he saved us, he put this amazing armor on. It's called the armor of God. Christ wore it. God wore it in Isaiah. It's an amazing armor. But God expects us to bloody that armor. God expects that, expects that armor to be dented and chinked because of the battles we wage. How are we ever going to test and prove the armor? We must go out into battle. The trials of the saints are the trying of the saints. God would have you put that armor to use. God would have you walk forth in the power of the Lord and in the strength of His might. But we'll never do that unless there's a trial. God's trying us because He wants to glorify Himself in our progressive sanctification. 
He wants to show the world that the work he has begun, he will bring to completion. He wants to show the world what it is to see a people die more and more to sin and live more and more to righteousness. He wants to show the world what it is that a changed heart is made within a person, evidenced by the changed life that comes out day after day and day by day. God is trying us because he wants to bless us with more of his grace, more of his strength, more of his love, more of himself. When are we ever going to get that? Not if we're sitting in the sunshine on the beach all the time. We've got to be tried. We've got to be tested. God doesn't throw us into trials because he hates us. God doesn't leave us there because he's ignoring us. God doesn't leave us there because he delights in it. He enjoys it. God leaves us there to see us grow. God leaves us there because that's what it's going to take to get the dross out. That's what it's going to take to expose the pride, the lust, the anger, the jealousy, the worldliness that we never thought we had. That we thought was only our brother's problem, our sister's struggle. Now we see it's ours. We're just the same. God help me. God have mercy. And therefore, thirdly, let me remind you that whenever the Lord afflicts you, his heart is set on doing you good by it and never harm. Beloved, God may sometimes lump you into the same basket with the wicked, like the basket Jeremiah saw with both bad figs and good figs. God may bring you under the same trial and suffering, but know this, in whatever God does with you, his heart is towards you. His love is set on you. And his motive, which is the great determiner, his motive is to make you a greater partaker of his holiness in order that you might enjoy a greater measure of his fellowship. Because as strange as it may sometimes look, that's what God's doing. That's what he's after. That's what it's all about, beloved. He's making way in your life for greater fellowship with you. But God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And within us, there's a lot of darkness. <laughs> there's a lot of sins and a lot of spots. And as Amos says, can two walk together unless they agree? Beloved, God wants to walk with you. God wants you to walk with him. And the greater the agreement, the more intimate the walk. The more intimate the communion. The more intimate the fellowship. The more powerful the transformation and conformation and metamorphosis into the image of Jesus Christ. But God wants you to walk closer with him. Beloved, something's got to go. Some things have to go. In fact, many things have to go. What has to go, we ask? Well, God knows, doesn't he? Praise God, he knows what has to go. And so God troubles us on the right. He troubles us on the left and, and behind and before. As Thomas Boston says, where is the idol? That's where God's going to crook the lot. Wherever God pokes, look for an idol. That's why he's poking. So that he takes things away. So that he brings us down to one knee, as it were. And God says, do you see what I see? Do you love me more than these? Let it go. I would walk with you, my child. Let it go. What a tender call. What a tender call is every trial, every heartache, every furnace, every affliction. What a tender call. God wants to be with us. He wants to sup with us, says the Lord Jesus in Revelation chapter 3. He wants to come in and dwell with us by his spirit. And what a mess is this interior of ours. But oh, how committed is he to clean it, to wash it, a fuller soap, as it were, to wash every spot whiter than snow. God's making great way for greater fellowship with you, which is best experienced in all our trials when we're driven out of ourselves to lean more on him. Let me prove it to you this way. Whenever, God, whenever God's desire to have more fellowship with you requires him to bring hardship and pain and suffering and even great losses into your life. Let me remind you that there is something of a divine reluctance in his heart to have to do it. God isn't beset with passions as we are, of course. This is an anthropomorphism, but this is a biblical one, so we use it. There is something of a divine reluctance in the heart of God to have to pain you. 
It's like when a father, as I said earlier, when a father's heart aches and recoils to have to discipline and pain the child he so dearly loves. So your heavenly father is so far from enjoying afflicting you that his heart aches to have to take up something like a cross and lay it on your back. Which is why Lamentations 3.33, very easy to remember. Lamentations 3.33 says he does not afflict from his heart. Or as the King James says, he doth not willingly grieve the children of men. He doesn't do it willingly. Does he do it unwillingly? Well, in some respects, yes. And so the ESV says he does not afflict from his heart. It means he does not afflict with his whole heart, which means God doesn't enjoy it when he has to trouble you. So that in all your suffering, let yourself be cast whole and entire, heart and soul, tears and all, onto the lap of what we've already learned before in Jeremiah 32, where the Lord says to you, I will never cease to do you good. With all my heart and all my soul, I will rejoice over doing you good. What a promise. That's the promise upon which we stand to build our hope when everything is against us. When the hand of God is against us, we stand on that. I can't see the hand of God so clearly as being for me because it so clearly seems against me. The next question, the first question I need to ask is, where is God's heart? And Jeremiah says, I will never cease doing you good with all my heart. So put these two verses together. If God ever afflicts me, he doesn't do it with his whole heart. What does he do with his whole heart then? He loves me. He shows me mercy and grace. And he pours out his affection toward me, even in the midst of the furnace. This is our God. What this means is, if there is any suffering in our lives, then there's a good reason for it. There's some good reason in the loving heart of God, which is why... Our pain and our tears and our hardship, if it's determined to be the necessary means to bring us closer to Him, then we should trust Him. Because what does Lamentation 3.33 say? But that if there was any other way to go about it, God would do it. That's what it means when God says, I do not afflict you willingly, not with my whole heart. If there is any other way to bring the desired result about, I would do it. But my child, I love you so much and I would have that end so desperately. God wants his own end and glory in our lives. And therefore he tosses us into the furnace and he turns up the heat and he stands it back while it does its work. So great is his love. So great is his longing to fellowship with us, to walk with us in complete agreement. That's the motive that drives him toward us. That's the motive behind it all. And therefore, lastly, let me remind you of what becomes so much more clear to us in the New Testament that Job could see in this passage. And that is that for however it may appear, that God sometimes stands idly by and watches us suffer. We need to remember that there is more to the story than that. Praise God, there's a lot more to the story than that. God always not only is with us in our suffering, but he is working for us in our suffering. With a heart so full of love and compassion and yearning for us as his is, it is more impossible for God to ever stand idly by and do nothing when we're hurting than it would be for a loving husband to stand idly by while his beloved wife was being beaten to death by violent men. It is more impossible for God to stand idly by at the side of your suffering than it would be for such a loving husband to stand idly by at his wife's abuse. Just because God is not intervening with deliverance or relief as we think he should doesn't mean he's not intervening at all. That's what we need to adjust in our thinking. Because our faith, our confession, our testimony tells us so. And therefore I want you to remember these few things. Number one. When you're in the furnace of suffering, Malachi 3.3 says your heavenly father has his eye on your soul to see that it's not harmed. In other words, the better part of you, the good part of you. That's why we were told not to fear those who can destroy the body. What can they do to the soul? Nothing. And the soul is the better part. 
And so when God throws us into the furnace, however it afflicts our body, God keeps an eye on our soul to see that it is not harmed. And he keeps his hand on the temperature to see that we never suffer more than is necessary for our spiritual improvement. There's nothing arbitrary about this at all. Secondly, when you feel alone on the battlefield and you see nothing but your untended wounds and you find yourself, as it were, bleeding out and no one around to help. Deuteronomy 33, 27 says, Your heavenly Father is all the while upholding you with His everlasting arms. He's bearing you up so that you do not fall. He's preserving your faith so that it does not fail. And He's carrying you through so that you don't fall short. And ultimately, He's protecting you from the full range of Satan's malice so that all things will most certainly work together for your good. Thirdly, when you feel like your prayers are not being heard, Hebrews 7.25 says your Savior is interceding for you and ensuring that you will be saved to the uttermost and one day soon will share His glory with you. Where He is, there we will be also. also. Beloved, we're going home. We're going home. He has ensured it by ascending ahead of us as it were, in our name and securing our place, preparing it for us so that he may one day soon come and get us. Fourthly, when you feel abandoned by God, Isaiah 26 verse 1 says, your Savior hasn't ever left your side. But instead he has his arms around you like the walls of an ark or a fortress, keeping you all the while and hemming you in on all sides. You truly are in his hands. And lastly, when you feel like God's forgotten you and he's cast you off with the wicked, treating you as he treats them, Jeremiah 32, 41 says, His heart means you well. His hand is working for your good and his wisdom will bring it all beautifully to the end together so that you'll live to sing his praise and exalt his name, singing with David, Bless the Lord. O oh, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, for he is good, and he does me good all the days of my life. So I leave you this morning with, with what has become a precious verse to my own heart. John 13, verse 7. Jesus said to his disciples at a time of great confusion and misunderstanding, a time of very little clarity, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will understand later. And I pray that God might use those words to enable you to trust his heart when you cannot see his hand. And to say with believing David in every circumstance you're in, this I know, that God is for me. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we believe, O oh Lord, help our unbelief. How hard it is, O oh God, to trust you when the lights go out. How hard it is to follow you, Lord, when we can't see the next foothold. How hard it is to hold on when we feel like you have let go of us. Lord, trials and troubles are always painful. They are never pleasant. They hurt. And our feelings, Lord, scream against our faith so much, so strongly. Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit today and make us all the more those who live by faith. For you, you take no delight in those who shrink back in unbelief. And so, work in our hearts. Cause us, O oh Lord, by your preserving power to persevere. And by your holding hand, help us to hold on. Help us to stand solidly and enduringly upon your precious promises and the testimony of your true and good character. That you are our God. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you are for us. 
you will not destroy us. You will not do us ill. You will not come in wrath. Thank you that you will discipline us in just measure as a father does his child whom he loves. Thank you that you will bring good out of all of our troubles. Thank you that you put all our tears in the bottle and that you can heal our broken hearts. Thank you for your forgiveness and your grace so that while you afflict half-heartedly, thank you that you show mercy and grace wholeheartedly. And we bless you for that. And in that we find hope today. Be with your people. Set their eyes upon you and you alone. For the sake of Jesus whom we love and in whom we trust. Amen.